Uh, I'm Dan Dyla. I work for Dynatrace. Uh, I'm also a maintainer of the JavaScript SDK uh, and a member of the governance committee. Um, uh, hi, my name is Jack Berg. I'm employed by New Relic. Uh, I'm a maintainer on the OpenTelemetry Java project, and uh, I focus a lot on metrics and logs implementation stuff. So, Hi, um, I'm Aaron Clausen. Uh, I work for New Relic. I'm in the Go SIG. Um, <laughs> my, my brain just farted. Uh, no, I work for Light Staff. That's why I'm wearing their swag. <laughs> so that's how this is going to go, huh? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, go SIG, and uh, I've been working very hard recently on the metrics. So that's where my brain is right now, which is probably why I had such a flub already. So it's okay. We would rather you focus on metrics. <laughs> All right. So, anyone questions here? If people are not ready to speak yeah, or, up, or I or I get to ask some questions, so we will pick on you if you're not raising your hand. <laughs> All right. I will. Oh, had most of our uh, instrumentations contributed by outside people. That was actually how Amir got uh, originally involved with the project. Was he was maintaining so many instrumentations that we were like, you should just be a maintainer. <laughs> um, I'll go. Uh, one of the things that I saw uh, with the double-edged sword of that community repo, uh, of the contrib repo, is that it's also very difficult to uh, maintain that, right? Um, there are lots of contributors in the Go side that uh, do contribute some really cool, interesting instrumentations, um, or they want to, but uh, we've had problems with them being maintained long term, right? Like making sure that security updates still get applied and that they are viable in um, in the long term. So just being able to manage that has been both really awesome, seeing the cool stuff that comes out of it, but also like everything that we accept um, creates more burden, more, more other toil. Um, so uh, that kind of leads into the other thing is um, just in general, having the, the engineering hours across the board to maintain and to build on all of the, uh, the cool projects that we're working with, right? Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to see people here and, and see people using it and, and hopefully uh, getting interest in, in contributing back to this project uh, because there's a lot of really cool stuff that people are building and I'm surprised by it every day, so. Yeah, and one thing the, the JavaScript SIG has done in, in the line of uh, maintaining those, the contrib instrumentations is sort of, uh, I guess what I would call distribution of ownership uh, so, uh, in the early days, everything was just in the contrib repo, it was on the maintainers, and it was like five instrumentations, ten instrumentations, and it was like, okay, we can maintain these. And then it was 20, and then it was 30, and now I think it's like, what, 50 or something like that? And it's like, that's too much for four maintainers who are primarily focusing on the SDK anyways. Uh, so now what we have uh, is uh, individual contributors who own or uh, maintain a single instrumentation in the, the contrib repo. Uh, and the people that, that do those and are willing to say, I'll maintain one, I'll maintain two, I'll maintain three. Uh, like, those people do not, and if any of you are in the room, thank you. You do not know how much that helps me if you take even just one or two. Uh, that's been huge. All right, we got a question from the chat here. Uh, for the panel, how do you relate your work on a vendor-neutral open source project to your employer uh, or to the people that sign your paychecks? In other words, if there's not someone above you that's already kind of enlightened to the value of contribution, how have or would you advocate for making a certain percentage of your time be devoted to open telemetry? That's a tough one. Uh, I think most of us here come from companies who are already uh, uh, enlightened, I guess you would say, to that. Um, but to those that aren't, uh, I would say the open source projects don't exist without contributors. And 
everybody who works here, I'm sure, works at companies who depend on open source projects. So even if there isn't like direct obvious business value, which for some there are, but for some there may not be, uh, it's sort of the uh, the rising tide raises all ships type of philosophy. Uh, and uh, I think that that can be really helpful. Uh, so I, I've worked at companies in the past that have, uh, oh, am I not close enough? Uh, you know, that have had a lot of uh, business value extracted from open source projects. And um, they, they haven't really been maintainers on those. And I, I've always thought that was kind of questionable. So um, if, you, if, if, if your business has a strategic dependency on some sort of open source project, I think it, you, you wouldn't feel comfortable if you had a proprietary software that you didn't have expertise in and have the ability to change in response to um, you know, security vulnerabilities or other sorts of events. So wh why, why are companies more open to uh, not having that understanding and the ability to change the, the open source projects that they have the same dependencies on. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it makes sense from a strategic standpoint to to place engineers in a in a, in a position where they uh, they can they can make changes to those projects as needed. So uh, I will echo what Dan said at the beginning is I'm currently working for a, uh, an outfit that really has embraced the open source. Um, but I, you don't always work for those companies. And um, my one recommendation is start small. Um, it's a very big ask to say, hey, can I even get 10% of my time to dedicate towards helping and improving the open source projects? But it's a lot easier to ask for, hey, I made a fix, like this package had a problem that we ha we are experiencing, I made a fix, can I release that? And go through the process of getting that and just training that muscle within the organizations. So start as small as you can and work up if you can. Yeah, I think like um, for me, uh, some of my time is like, uh, um, most of the, of the time I'm working uh, for a vendor, for a Spectre, but uh, some of the time I just uh, like uh, change hat and then I just do the most uh, professional uh, work that I can regardless of uh, where, I, where I work. And uh, I think like um, because I'm doing all these reviews and I'm so intimate with the code, then uh, like I, I, when I do it, I don't do it uh, for, the, for my uh, workplace, but... Uh, I just uh, do the reviews and then I see how it pays back when I do my other work that's uh, related to to my, uh, because because we use open telemetry in our, our distribution. Um, yeah. Oh, we got questions back here, so. Hey y'all, um, I'm Ariel from the Ruby SIG. So uh, just wondering from y'all, what's your experience been working with trying to uh, build in instrumentations that have for first party support in libraries versus doing things like uh, third party support and adding stuff um, uh, like uh, bytecode manipulation or in our case monkey patches really for, for a lot of these libraries. And what's been the appetite of library uh, maintainers for wanting to try to accept contributions and changes? I think you were alluding to that a little bit uh, just now. I'll, start, I'll kick it off. Um, so Go is kind of in a weird position where uh, it's very, very difficult to add in support to something that doesn't, isn't open to that, right? Um, but there's also a wonderful ecosystem where people do think in layers, right? Um, like in the net HTTP, the built-in standard uh, library, it actually is built around that you're going to wrap this. And, and that's something that, that happens quite frequently in that environment. Um, that being said, there's a wide range of the support that we have been able to uh, engender. Um, some places getting first party support um, like at CD, but then um, some just almost being almost to the point of like refusing to uh, support kind of interoperability. So 
I think one of the things you have to kind of gauge along with uh, everything else is just how open your environment is to um, accepting those kind of uh, kind of changes. Yeah, I guess uh, I work in JavaScript, which is totally the opposite to Go. Uh, if somebody doesn't want their library instrumented, then too bad. We're going to do it anyway. It's always easy to get it from the out, you know, easy in air quotes, e you know, relatively easy to get it from the outside. Uh, but uh, we've seen not too many that are willing to uh, build in open telemetry directly exactly, but they are sometimes willing to add uh, hooks that we can then write a, an outside instrumentation against that are stable. Um, and there's been some ongoing work in, uh, in the Node ecosystem to improve that and make that sort of a standard thing, uh, which if you're using recent versions of Node, then, then good for you. Uh, unfortunately, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people run older versions where we can't always do that. Um, but the, uh, I think the, the instability is probably the wrong word, but the, the, the project has only recently gotten to a point where I think a lot of uh, package maintainers feel like this is stable, it's going to be around long term, there are a lot of users, and we're just reaching the point where I think we are going to have that critical mass of users where a library vendor looks at it and says, wow, a lot of my users <laughs> do use open telemetry and maybe this would be really valuable for them. Uh, so I think it's, it's less about uh, the technical aspects and more about convincing uh, maintainers of, of those other projects uh, that the value is there and will continue to be there long term. Yeah, in Java, we kind of we kind of run the gamut. Uh, so there's the, the majority of our instrumentation is on the it's auto instrumentation, so bytecode manipulation, and uh, as the JavaScript folks say, we can just do it. And so we don't we don't need uh, extension points or anything built into the libraries. Um, we can modify the, the code at runtime, uh, and you know a lesser extent is library instrumentation. So libraries that provide uh, specific extension points or that we wrap. Uh, and then a very few number of libraries, MicroProfile is one of them, uh, have have you know embraced open telemetry and added direct instrumentation. And uh, I'm hopeful that as as the uh, we have API stability around the the core signals, that there, there's more of those. That's that's kind of uh, a future I look forward to in my head. So uh, we'll see where that goes, though. Yeah, and as a maintainer, I think it'd be a lot easier if if somebody that maintains a library or a project is maintaining the instrumentation because they know it better than we do. Yeah, I know this is Ted's baby, so. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to pretend to be a maintainer for a second and mention that we haven't really been pushing for library developers to um, add native instrumentation, mainly because it hasn't felt like the project has been stable enough yet to do that not just the APIs, but also the semantic conventions. I feel like we really wanna get that stable before we start kind of like actively pushing that idea out there. But it's really cool to see some people just dive on in and go for it. Yeah, I mean, I just to echo that a little bit, we don't want to make a big push to say, you should build this in and then you know move the cheese later. And then when they say, why did you do that? You told me to do this and you said it would be fine. And it's like, well, it was unstable. Yeah. There, yeah. Go, we we want to only make promises that we can keep if we can handle that. Go find the Envoy people and they have a lot of fun things to say about tracing, open source tracing. Um, we have another question from the, or did you want to go? I just want to say, uh, yeah. um, I haven't seen yet a package that uh, implements open telemetry directly. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, challenges around it because uh, it will require people to upgrade the version of the package that they use to get telemetry or better telemetry, like suddenly uh, those two, the features and the telemetry are coupled together, uh, which currently is not the case. Like they can just upgrade the uh, open telemetry and get the latest uh, instrumentation fixes uh, without touching the version of the uh, package, uh, the client that they use. Uh, so I'm very curious to see how it will work looking forward to it. All right, we have another question from the audience. Hi. 
Hi. Um, Antu Vo from Avel Technology. We build, at least my division, we build data processing units. And we're launching the open programmable infrastructure, we Linux Foundation, tomorrow. And within that group, we have been mostly official, not announced yet, uh, adopting open telemetry for the chips. So, thank you. I'm just a member. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the question is, we're gonna implement, at least for us, Marvell, we're gonna implement hotel collector agents on our chips, uh, probably dedicate an ARM core to it. It's preliminary design, mostly in my head right now. Um, my question is, process, pointers, thoughts, on how do we do that? You know, piggyback on the, the, the answer just now about you know, libraries and version packaging and all that, among other things. Well, um, one of the nice benefits of the collector is that it's kind of its own dedicated package. Um, one of the downsides is that it is something that is designed to run mainly on Linux, it can run on other platforms. So um, honestly, my suggestion is just make sure that it has a processor, a Linux environment, even if you're running a container, uh, a uh, from scratch container that just has the binary, if it has the processor and the memory, um, it's probably going to be a good experience. but. That also just means you also have to be able to integrate it with the rest of your platform. Um, there, there's a lot of unknowns there because uh, I, I don't know how your platform is connected to everything else. But um, you, you're probably like ninety percent there at least um, if you've got an ARM and some memory. An arm and a leg. <laughs> right? It, well, any metrics that we would recommend in extending? So are, are you asking about like platform metrics or like? So uh, I know the collector has the contrib repo um, for anything particular for that. Um, I'm not I'm not a contrib maintainer, so uh, don't take my word as truth. Um, but that's probably where I would start. But uh, the collector is a process just like any other process running on a computer. So um, define the metrics that tell you that this is good. Right, like the, the system is running well. Um, and that, that's gonna be different for every platform and especially if you're going to be commingling those metrics with your platform metrics, you, you have, there's a journey there. Um, I, I can take you to a salesperson from probably a half dozen different companies to, to help you on that journey, um, but it, it is a journey. Yeah, it can be very individual. Um, one thing that I would say, uh, I've heard from Anthony Mirabella, uh, who is a collector maintainer, and uh, that really stuck with me, uh, is that he views the collector not as a like collector process, but as a framework for building collectors. So you have the the open telemetry collector repo, which is all of the like infrastructure around the, the collector itself, and then the contrib repo, which has all of the plugins and things like that. And you can pick the individual plugins that make sense for you, or uh, contribute a custom one if, if none of the existing ones make sense for your environment. And you can build a very targeted binary that can be much smaller, uh, where if, especially if you're co-deploying it at the platform level, uh, that is you know very important memory footprint, uh, CPU usage footprint, things like that, the more you can reduce the the ancillary stuff that you're not using out of the process, the better. 
Um, as a side note to that, if anyone here uh, is in a regulated industry or has extremely stringent corporate security and yeah, corporate security stuff, um, we would love to talk to you about how to get the output of the collector builder a certified thing uh, through supply chain security stuff because I don't, I'm editorializing, sorry. <laughs> One challenge I've noticed in especially the enterprise is that they will approve a given specific version of a collector binary, which is great, but is completely antithetical, antithetical to what you just said about the collector being a framework for building collectors. So there's some work that needs to be done. If anyone listening is interested in supply chain security or any of those like Linux foundation -y projects, then uh, we should talk about how we can kind of get good binary or verified validated binaries out of that uh, processor or out of that builder, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's not a challenge at a Linux Foundation event to find people interested in supply chain security. Yeah, no, I'm just going to go outside and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in the hall and scream, supply chain security! Where's my supply chain security fanatics at? All right, I got another question from the chat. Um, what have been the biggest challenges with implementing the API and SDK across the supported languages in a standardized way? How much does the SDK configuration feel native to your language? Oh man, that's a big one. Um, it, obviously, there have been a lot of challenges involved. Um, the, the biggest challenges that we have is making it feel native in any uh, individual language. Because we could have, you, you can go one of two ways. You can say, this is what the API looks like. Every language has to implement this exact uh, you know, method name with these arguments and all of that, and it's the same in every language. But then a Ruby developer looks at it and says, well, this isn't how we typically name things. It feels weird to me. Uh, or a Go developer looks at it and says, this isn't how we normally name things. It feels weird to me or how I normally structure my project or anything like that. So. Uh, if you read the specification, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with the specification, you'll notice it leaves a lot of leeway. It defines the way that features should work and feel uh, and the value that they should provide and how they should do that. But it does also leave a lot of leeway for imp uh, individual implementations uh, to make it feel native for their users, uh, which I, has been extremely helpful for me uh, as a, you know, a maintainer to say, I'm looking for people who know JavaScript, not necessarily people who are super intimately familiar with the way that other OTEL SDKs or the specification work. Uh, I will echo that. Um, there is always going to be a compromise between being cross-portable across, like taking your knowledge from one language to another and the native way things would do. Uh, Python, Go, any language has their own idiosyncrasies. And uh, in the Go SIG, we do have compromises that have to be made to be able to meet what the API um, documents ask of us. Um, that being said, it's, it's a worthy trade-off to have that knowledge also be portable. So. Yeah, for sure. If you have uh, uh, an open telemetry, uh, a team in your organization using open telemetry and they're a Python team and you're a JavaScript team and you're trying to build on their expertise, the fact that the, uh, the APIs are similar and feel similar means that that knowledge transfer within your organization to different teams can be much, much easier. Although I would say that they don't feel entirely similar. There's a, the ergonomics from language to language um, yeah, it's not entirely intuitive. Uh, so I, I, I think of the specification as more of a, a specification of, of functionality rather than like ergonomics. And so, you know, you'll be able to find the same features in each each of the language. But um, yeah, we, we had some maintainers in Java that, you know, just recently used the Go SDK and API and they were kind of, uh, uh, they were kind of surprised at how different it felt. So uh, trade-offs, trade-offs. All right, got another question from the audience. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shubanshu. Uh, I'm part of Adobe, and I'm part of the observability team at Adobe, and we are trying to uh, 
increase the adoption of open telemetry at Adobe. So we interact with a lot of engineering teams. And so first of all, I would like to thank the Java community for building the auto instrumentation. Teams at Adobe loves that. That makes their tracing and instrumentation easy and onboard to them. Uh, so my question is for the other communities or other uh, SIGs in general, like what are your thoughts on adding instrument auto instrumentation as part of the library? And what were the key challenges you faced when you for specifically for Java since that's in G and I know Node.js is working on it uh, on getting that rolled out? Well, I'll just say before we get too far is that so we were supposed to have Trask here. He couldn't make it, and he's uh, he's uh, one of the maintainers for the Open Telemetry Java uh, instrumentation project, which is where the auto instrumentation comes from. And so uh, you know, I'm kind of on the other side of things in the in the Java space. I, I work a little bit with those folks, but uh, I work primarily on the the API and SDK. Um, so big shout out to the instrumentation folks uh, on your behalf. Uh, uh, I know they faced a lot of challenges along the way to get the agent uh, to, to where it is today, and so. Yeah, so for, for the JavaScript SIG, I would say uh, our primary focus has been on getting the, uh, you know, the signals to a stable uh, level within the SDK, uh, because when they're not stable, maintaining very advanced instrumentation can be difficult if the API changes you then have to go change 50 60 packages which can be uh, a challenge obviously um, we also have a lot of issues with different versions of node supporting different things uh, and and maintaining backwards compatibility uh, because the node uh, the node community is not uh, always on the latest versions, I guess I would say. Um, Is there anybody? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, every, every community has those problems. Um, but a lot of our, so we don't have the auto instrumentation the way that Java does where you can just uh, run a single command and it works. But I know we actually have been uh, working on that uh, and I would say hopefully coming soon. Uh, but until then, if you can modify just the startup of your of your process, you can actually get quite a bit. Um, if you, uh, you know, we have like a, if, if you're familiar with Node, there's like a dash R flag that's short for register, which, which will load, or short for require, which will load uh, a file before your application loads. And it only takes like 10 lines uh, in like a tracing JS file to do the setup work required uh, in order to then, when your application loads, everything is automatically instrumented. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can uh, come find me or come find us on the, the Slack and the, the JS channel. Uh, and we'd be very interested to hear about your experiences with that. Uh, and I'm sure that many of the other language SIGs would, would have the same sort of sentiment. I will say from a Go perspective, um, it's a very challenging problem because um, just the way Go is typically structured uh, and the fact that we aren't allowed to patch out um, out of library uh, commands. So like I can't replace, you know, a database. Um, the only thing I can do is uh, do a uh, do a wrap around that database. So Joe ha Go has a very particularly challenging environment for that kind of auto instrumentation. Um, that being said, I know there are some people that are just getting off the ground trying to work that in Go. Um, and it's it's monumental task for them. Um, I also wonder if for Go, just the way we've built the uh, the way the language is built if maybe just having easy ways to wrap um, is enough because it's very common for go programs to start off with setting up a number of your dependencies uh, right off the bat so uh, the 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 tldr of that is um it's really hard in go uh it's not friendly for that so it might come hopefully 
I think auto instrumentation is uh, super important. Like uh, we're all very involved in open telemetry. We know all the details and how to set up an SDK and configure it and register everything and uh, how it all works. But uh, people that uh, want to use open telemetry, they usually it's just one task of other things they have to do. They want to get started as quickly as possible, as easily as possible. They don't want to spend a few days learning all the details. They just tell us, give you something that uh, is very easy, uh, preferably if I don't need to, to, to change my code or create a PR or risk anything. Um, it's a very good experience, at least for the beginning. So I think, uh, I really think uh, we should try to, to do it as best as we can. Very important. I would also quickly mention, uh, I'm not super familiar with this, so I won't speak about it for a long time, but I know that the uh, the operator project does do some uh, like auto injection, even in languages uh, like JavaScript, like where I said, we don't necessarily have the no code modification set up, uh, but uh, where the initial setup is easy to do, if you're running in a Kubernetes op uh, environment, the, the operator can do some of that injection for you. Uh, and again, I'm not super familiar with it, but yeah. uh, I know it's there. It's Node, Python, and Java right now. Um, I would imagine .NET will come once the .NET agent gets more, less alpha. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Hello. Uh, as far as infrastructure metrics are concerned um, and the the kind of recommended way to play within the infrastructure metrics ecosystem now that Prometheus and the pole based system is kind of one, the, the dominant uh, structure there. What's the recommendation as far as um, open telemetry metrics emission and collection from host base and um, points within the infrastructure? Is it re to recommend it to always have the pull based method and then also how do metrics worth work within the uh, SDKs as far as that do we stick with Prometheus and have that exposed there or um, uh, within open, open telemetry is it any different and how does open metrics fit into the metrics in open telemetry as well so uh, just a heads up your story is going to be very different from everybody else's. Uh, your infrastructure, your application, and everything are very personalized to your business model. So this is not blanket recommendation for everybody everywhere. Um, but my general thoughts are, if you have something that's working, keep using that unless it's not working, right? Unless you have some extra feature. That being said, there is definitely an overlap between the push-based metrics and the pull-based metrics in what they are good at serving. Um, and you can actually do both. You're supposed to be able to do both with open telemetry. Um, it's, it can be difficult to set up, but you can get it going. Um, at least in Go, it, it can be, this, it can start off difficult to set up. We're, we're, still, we're still working in that space. But um, uh, the nice part, one of the nice things that I think about the open telemetry platform in general is that collector is a tool that you can utilize to kind of uh, aggregate both of those sets of data. So if you already have an infrastructure that is Prometheus based or um, open metrics based, which is sort of the evolution of Prometheus in a way, um, the collector is there to be able to pull that as well as to receive data from your applications that you're doing in open telemetry metrics. And that can all be aggregated. And that's, that's a wonderful tool. Um, so if you're starting off fresh, give open telemetry a try and, and see if it meets your needs. If you already have something that's working, give the collector a try and, and use that as a tool to leverage what you already have so you don't have to rework it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, I would, uh, I guess, challenge the assertion that uh, pull-based metrics has won, not because I think push-based metrics won, but because I don't think it's a, a question of, 
of winning and losing, they, dif they, they both make sense in different use cases and they can be used side by side. Uh, one example I would give is a, a common deployment pattern we see is uh, uh, an application running on a host that has open telemetry built in that exports to a collector that's running on the same host that may be gathering host metrics and exporting those using you know, whatever format, OTLP, Prometheus, anything like that. And that collector may also be scraping Prometheus endpoints from different processes on the host, which were already instrumented uh, using Prometheus. Like he said, if it's not broken, there's no reason. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that you should switch just because uh, open telemetry is new and shiny. Like if you have something that's working, then great. But on the other hand, if you have a problem or if you see a feature of open telemetry, you're like, wow, I really wish that I could use that. Uh, it's not like you have to switch all of your infrastructure. It's, 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 I won't say easy to run side by side necessarily because like you said, every environment's different, uh, but it can be done. Uh, and I would you know, recommend giving that a shot. Yeah, I just want to add that you, uh, reinforce that the collector is your friend here. So, um, you know, uh, in, in, in kind of modern cloud environments, you, you have a variety of applications that emit data in a variety of protocols. Um, the collector is, is basically the solution to that. It's, it, it provides receivers that uh, uh, speak all the different protocols uh, you, you might be using and standardizes to an internal representation and provides tools to export, um, uh, to enrich the data and export it to wherever you want. And so uh, putting that in your environment really uh, in a lot of ways allows you to regain control uh, in, in, in situations where um, you might, you know, you, you're using uh, open source projects that are emitting in a variety of, of protocols and have limited configuration options around that, so. Yeah, and a lot of work has been done around and we're, we're very proud of uh, sort of the interoperability work that we've done uh, with Prometheus. Uh, I, I think maybe I saw Richie Hartman here. Uh, maybe I was hallucinating from the heat. Uh, Richie's here. He's been uh, extremely helpful from that perspective as well, from the Prometheus side. So it's very much like a, a, a community project. Uh, we're gonna we have time for maybe two more questions, maybe just this one. Um, so we're gonna end at the beginning with a question from the chat. I missed the intros and some of the starts, so ignore if this is duplicative. Uh, it's actually not. But I'd be curious as the panelists' backstories around getting into open telemetry, but not their full backstories. So how did, how did you all get into the wonderful world of open source observability? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, plan to. I started working at uh, Spectro, and um, we were originally we didn't use Open Telemetry, and then one day we said, "Okay, Open Telemetry is here. It's supposed to be great. Let's uh, give it a shot." And uh, yeah, that just rolled from there. I, it wasn't planned. I just uh, it just happened. I think it wasn't planned, it just happened, is going to be a recurring theme here. Um, I was, uh, you know, I work at Dynatrace. I was working uh, on an internal team that was uh, uh, doing some open telemetry related work. And as a part of that, I was contributing to open telemetry. And then I think, uh, as with a lot of open source communities, you'll find that once you start contributing, the, the existing maintainer community is like, yes, more, come in, do more. And it grows from there. Uh, and you know, you say yes to a few things and then suddenly you find yourself on the governance committee and you're like, how did this happen? <laughs> uh, so again, I would say I, I never really planned it. It did just happen. Uh, that said, if, uh, you know, if somebody said, oh, I have this, this great opportunity over here and I would, first question I would ask is can I continue my work on open telemetry because I probably wouldn't consider anything that would say no to that. Uh, you know, for me, it's table stakes now for anything that I'm going to do in the future. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I worked in web services for a while, um, you know, building out services in a uh, service oriented architecture. Uh, always kind of had a knack for observability and uh, was interested in uh, monitoring the systems that uh, me and my team wrote. And that brought me to, to, to New Relic. Uh, so 
uh, took a hobby and kind of went pro at it. Uh, and then, so New Relic, I, w I was kind of on the side, always interested in, in open source projects. I tried to open source a, uh, one of the main projects I worked on that was a proprietary project. Um, my, my, my company was having none of that. Uh, so I was really excited at, at New Relic's interest in, in open source. And so they, they gave me an opportunity to go and spend a lot of time working on open telemetry, which has been great. So. So mine's a little bit different. Um, I found OpenTelemetry because it solved about 90% of a problem that I had that was fairly unique. Um, so that's where I started contributing. Uh, but when my previous job was, uh, you know, getting towards the end of a, of a big project, and I'm like, I'm looking for something new, I, was, I asked some of the maintainers at the time, like, hey, is there any jobs that I could do OpenTelemetry work full time and they're like let, hold on a second let me go talk to half a dozen people we'll get you something going really quick and uh, that's where i found lightstep was able to uh, interview there and and in working full time on a team dedicated towards the improvement of open telemetry so uh, thank you um, we didn't we didn't ask him to say that by the way <laughs> that was all him that, that's, that was the <laughs> Everyone up here is hiring. Just assume that. I, everybody is hiring, I think. Uh, yeah. And if you're a hiring manager, take note, right? People want to work in open source. Yes. People love working in open source and open telemetry. All right. Last question then, uh, again from the chat. And this is a fun one to end on. If you had all the contributor bandwidth in the world, what would be the best use of that time, right? Um, how would that change maybe prioritization? Um, I guess some of this is a scaling question, right? Like if there, if we suddenly, like if everyone goes and tells 10 of their friends and we get a thousand new contributors tomorrow, like what is the best use of that time going to be? Where should people be focusing their efforts? You know, and let's wrap it up with this one. So down the line. I'll start. Um, reviews. That, like that's where we're lacking the most having good actual uh, PR reviews both of documentation of what the code is doing um, PRs are great issues are great I love them they, they save me time effort energy um, but I know I spend most of my time doing reviews and if there was somebody who could if there was a team of people that could help speed that process along, that could free myself up to, to be doing more, you know, to be enabling more cool things going forward. Uh, well, a thousand new people is a lot. I don't, I don't know if I would know how to apply that many person hours. Um, but so one, one of the things that I think about is, or needs more attention is, uh, so I think the, the specification needs more opinions. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different parallel tracks going on uh, of activity. And, um, you know, I think they move faster when there's people that are engaged and opinionated about uh, the direction that things should go. And so, um, you know, uh, logs and semantic conventions come to mind there. So uh, if you want to see those things stabilize, engage with those, those SIGs, bring an opinion to the table. And I think they will accelerate as a result. Yeah, I would, I would say semantic convention stability is going to be uh, huge for the project as a whole, not just for maintainers. If we want it to see long-term adoption and use, that's going to be something that absolutely needs to be taken care of. And uh, you know, like you said, a thousand people is a lot, but with a thousand people, you have uh, you know, call it a hundred or two hundred different areas of focus where some of those people may be experts in something. And if you're an expert in uh, you know, databases, then there's a semantic convention area for that. If you're an expert in RPC, there's a semantic convention area for that. If you're an expert in uh, host metrics, there's a semantic convention area for that. And all of these problems will need to be solved. And if we're only working with uh, the limited pool of people who is regular specification contributors, uh, they can only be deep experts in so many things. So looking for outside contributors that bring expertise that we don't have into the project 
uh, is huge. Uh, um, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, creativity and uh, good ideas out there. And uh, when someone is working on something that he believes in and wants to work on it and wants to see that it's implemented uh, the best and like be something great, then um, this is, uh, in my opinion, this is like the best uh, option. So if a thousand people come, so I just tell them, pick the thing that you believe that you want to, to see that uh, is implemented as best as possible and uh, work on it and uh, do what you do best. All right, and with that, oh, I got a question. I got a question. we have like 60 seconds. Yeah. Ted, you're banned. Ted, you can't come next year. Yeah. I'm kick what are you on? I'm kicking you off. Can we, Eloita's here, right? We, we can vote you out of the GC. All right. So thank you. That was all a joke for the virtual attendance. We all have fun here. All right. So let's give it up for our maintainers. This is a great panel. Thank you, both people here and on the chat who asked questions. Uh, now I would like to... Uh, bring up Michael Haberman from Aspecto, who will be talking about the unexplored world of open telemetry and service mesh.